It's a great privilege to open the Word of God to you. I have the text of Titus, chapter 3, verses 9 to 11. You should have an outline in your bulletin that should help, be able to help you follow along. In that outline, we're going to cover three verses and two main commands. One, the first command is to avoid foolish arguments. It's in the imperative. And second, in the imperative, is to reject divisive men. So those are the two simple commands that God wants you to do today. I'll also give another disclaimer that this sermon is not preached to be preached at any person in particular. I don't have a vendetta. I'm not out to get anybody. I was already studying this topic before any trouble would, um, had come up in our, in our church. So the, the, this, just so you know, this is, um, this is simply the study I was already doing, and it's the Word of God. Okay? So, by way of introduction, let's think about the idea of appeasement. Appeasement is a, in the political context, is, was made known by Neville Chamberlain. Appeasement in the political, po political context is a politi dip diplomatic policy of making political or material concessions to an enemy power in order to avoid conflict. The term most often applied to the foreign policy of British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain towards Nazi Germany between 1937 and 1939. His policies of avoiding war with Germany have been the subject of intense debate for 70 years among academics, politicians, and diplomats. And historians' assessments have ranged from condemnation for allowing Adolf Hitler's Germany to grow too strong to judgment that he had no alternative and acted in Britain's best interest. At the time, these concessions were widely seen as positive, and the Munich Pact con concluded on September 30th, 1938, among Germany, Britain, France, and Italy, prompted Chamberlain to announce he had secured peace in our time. So to give you the details of the story, Hitler goes into Czechoslovakia, and he begins to take Czechoslovakia and claim it for Germany. And there's a big political uprising. What are the other countries going to do? Are they going to allow Germany just to take this country? And so there's this Munich Pact. There's this agreement. And there's a famous pictures where British Prime Minister Chamberlain is shaking hands with Adolf Hitler in this peace pact in the year 1938. What happens in 1939? World War II. Chamberlain says upon his return, my good friends, this is the second time in our history that there has, there has come back from Germany to Downing Street peace with honor. I believe it is peace for our time. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts, and now I recommend to you go home and sleep quietly in your beds. Within the next six years, approximately 60 million people would be dead. Appeasement was not a good idea. Winston Churchill said about appeasement in this policy, he said, an appeaser is one who feeds a crocodile, hoping it will eat him last. An appeaser is one who feeds a crocodile, hoping it will eat him last. In the church, there is an idea concerning church discipline of appeasement, that let's make peace at all costs. But there must be a time when church discipline must be applied, must be applied biblically, wisely, not with haste. And the Word of God must be obeyed in this area. We must not fall into an appeasement. So let's turn to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, verses 9 to 11. But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped 
and sinning, being self-condemned. So let's begin to think about the overall understanding of Titus and the book as a whole. This book is a book telling us instructions for the church so that we would be careful to maintain good works. Look at this theme throughout Titus. Turn to chapter 1 of Titus. In verses 5 to 9, we have qualifications of elders. In verses 10 to 16, there's a warning about false teachers. In verse 16, it says they're disqualified for every good work. In chapter 2, verses 1 to 8, we have the importance of discipleship in the church. In verse 7, it says that in all, in all things, showing yourselves to be a pattern of good works. In verses 11 to 15, he says the grounding, he begins to look at the grounding of these good works, is in the gospel. He says in the end of verse 14 that this will produce a people zealous for good works. Chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey and to be ready for every good work. And again, he goes into the gospel in verses 3 to 7. And verses 8, the results of that. I want you to confirm constantly that those who believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. In verse 8, these are good and profitable to men. And he contrasts these good works instead with verses 9, 10, and 11. And then he ends the epistle in verses 14. And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. Church discipline is one of those good works. But what is the grounding for it? Why do we do it? You must be reminded of that if you're to obey this text and have the motive to obey this text in verses 9 to 11. Remind yourself of these truths in chapter 3, verses 3 to 7. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Have you forgotten... Have you forgotten how you were once foolish? How you didn't know the Bible? You may have professed yourself to be a Christian, but in reality, in the commands that are given, you didn't really know them. And you were disobedient. And you didn't want to know them. It wasn't that you couldn't read. It wasn't that you didn't know the Bible wasn't important. You were purposely a fool. Have you forgotten how you were disobedient? What you did know about the Bible, you disobeyed. You knew that lust was wrong. You knew that covetousness was wrong. You knew that that anger was wrong, and yet you disobeyed God anyway. He described us as we were deceived. Have you forgotten how you developed your own view of God so that it would, he would allow you to live whatever way you wanted have you forgotten how you were serving various lusts and pleasures? This word for serving is a word for slave. You were a slave to whatever your body told you. You were chained to it like a great rock that's pushed over a cliff and it pulls you over with, with it. Have you forgotten how you were a slave? Have you forgotten that you were living in malice and envy? hateful and hating one another. Something nice couldn't happen to someone else without you wanting it, without you desiring it. You couldn't forgive because you hadn't been forgiven. Do you remember holding on to that anger and bitterness, seething as you went to go sleep and as your blood pressure rose? But do you also remember in verse 4, but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior towards men appeared. Oh, what kindness. It's one thing to be kind to people who are kind to you, but it's another thing to be kind to your enemies. And God was kind to you when you were his enemy. 
What love is this? God our Savior. How did this come, verse 5? Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. This, is so far, this salvation is so far from anything you did. It is a work of being born again. He says, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. You didn't need a wash up. You didn't need a clean up. You didn't need a tune up. You needed a resurrection. And God himself gave it to you. Have you forgotten how he made you alive when you were dead in trespasses and sins? Verse 6, how he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, only because of what Christ has done. This grace was poured out to you. He's Jesus Christ our Savior, just like God is our Savior in verse 4. He is God our Savior, Jesus. In verse 7, he speaks about how we've been justified by his grace and become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We've been declared righteous in his sight and adopted. In this salvation, you just don't get your sins forgiven and relate to God somehow like the angels do. No, you get to relate to God as adopted, as a son, and be an heir. Because of this wonderful truth in this gospel, you should be faithful to uphold good works. If he has given everything to you, if he didn't spare his own son, how could you not obey him in the smallest things, like with our friends? In verse 8, he says, this is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. And what about those good works? What's the character of them? They are good and profitable to men. But in verse 9, what's a contrast? But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. You see how unprofitable and useless contrasts with good and profitable in the verse before. Okay, so here's the first good work in our text. Avoid foolish arguments. Avoid them. Get around them. The word here to describe the avoiding is often used to walk around something. It's used to shun. It's used to get a distance from. When you see foolish arguments coming, don't partake in them. What are some of the foolish arguments then? The foolish arguments, first he starts with a general term, foolish disputes. Here he's describing things like, I'm going to put it in our, it's a general term here. He's going to, go, he's going to get into more specifics. So some of the general ideas that people will want to talk about today that you're to avoid. How about, um, in many, with many commentaries, men spend their entire lives debating the, the liberalism of today. And they spend their entire life writing articles and studying foolish arguments that should be rejected, that they've already been proven false, and move on already. The Bible is true. You don't need to continually debate in, in those who are in academic circles in order to make yourself look smart. That's a foolish argument that should be, we should move on and move on to more important things. Godliness, righteousness, what the, the Lord wants us to do, what he's instru instructing in this epistle. I, you should not spend time um, debating all day with the many details of those in the Jehovah Witnesses about whether Jesus died on a stake or whether he died on a cross or these many, many arguments that come up that are not going to be applicable to how we live and follow the Lord. The next, next example that the Lord gives is genealogies. Genealogies, remember this is used one other time in the in New Testament. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 4. Pastor Mark covered this. It has to do with th this old Jewish idea of looking at the genealogies and saying, you know, this is kind of boring. 
Um, let's spice it up a little bit in order to make it more interesting. Let's think up a story and make up a story about somebody in the genealogy. And so it becomes kind of like Aladdin's tales. Oh, wow, the genealogy became very interesting and exciting. You're ma they're making up fanciful myths and stories. Think about today, how we have every few years this idea of a Bible code comes up. The Bible code is a fanciful idea that maybe you'll see it online, you know, click here and find out the secret meaning of the Bible. And I'm like, well, I thought it just came from reading the Bible. No, there's, there's a secret hidden meaning of the Bible. And it works kind of like this. You, you take a word like troops, T-R-O-O-P-S, and then you say you're going to take out every other letter and, you, and it comes out with top. Okay, so then you turn to Acts 6 and 7, and you're like, okay, let's take out every other word and see what we can find. And you're like, I found a J, I found an F, I found a K, JFK. There's a hidden prophecy about the JFK assassination in here. <laughs> These things aren't new. They come back every generation. It's not just new to Google or whatever, however you see it on. It, it is something that continually comes back. It's a foolish, fanciful idea like the genealogies. You should not spend time debating it. You should avoid it. You avoid it because it makes peace in the church. You don't fall into the trap. I remember being with a, uh, a brother, and we were open air preaching, and Hiawassee and Silver Star, and there was a cult there preaching about how... Um, don't you, if anyone who eats lobster is of the devil. And he, they were looking at us, they, they knew us, that we were Christians, and this cult is preaching about, you know, not eating pork and things like that. And they say, if anybody has any argument that shows that you can eat this stuff, say it now. And they look right at us. <laughs> and I'm looking, I opened my Bible to 1 Timothy 4, about he's given us various foods, whatever we want to eat. And I'm like, this is a foolish dispute. What am I going to do? Are you in front of a whole bunch of people in public about eating lobster? <laughs> what would it do to the gospel? Everyone who we were there to reach with the gospel would say, oh, look at these guys arguing over lobster. This is stupid. And it would be, right? Next, he talks about contentions. It's not just strange, aberrant theological things that he's talking about here. Contentions is a general term about fighting. It's a general term about strife, discord, arguments. It's used in 1 Corinthians 1 and 1 Corinthians 3 to describe the argument of, I'm of Paul, I'm of Paulus, I'm of Jesus. It can be a strife among Christians. It's used in Philippians 1, verses 16 to 18, where those who are preaching Christ in order to get at Paul and hurt him while he's in jail. These contentions are in the sin list in Galatians 5.20 about the works of the flesh. They're in Romans 1.29 about the unrighteous deeds, this strife, this contention, this fighting, is in the list of those marks of an unbeliever there. It's also in Romans 13:13, 13, 13, where in this section of application to Christians about how we're not to live with strife and envy. Paul gives it in 2 Corinthians 12:20 in a sin list that Paul doesn't want the Corinthians to fall into. And it's also a characteristic of a false teacher in 1 Timothy 6:4. It's general arguing, general discord is in the list of something to avoid to go around. He finishes out his list with strivings about the law. That's like arguing with the Seventh-day Adventist about what you're going to eat. Or arguing with the, someone who goes to um, a messianic congregation about wearing a, a prayer shawl. He's arguing about ceremonial aspects of the law. Don't get into the debate. 
let me help you. When you are prideful, you're more prone to get in debates. When you like to sit back and think, you know, I know a lot. And I need to show that to people that I know a lot. Here's somebody I can put that on display with. Ah, and you are eager for the opportunity to put your knowledge on display. Don't fall into that debate. You got a, a wise man assess this. Is this a fight worth getting into? Is this going to be helpful for the gospel? Is this going to be helpful for this person's soul? You see? There's com we're commanded here to avoid those foolish things. And it's a mix of doctrinal issues, and it's a mix of foolish things that are of life. Doctrine and life. Doctrine and life. There's regular discord and contention in this list. Okay, so the key part that we're to cover today is verse 10. We've seen that we, one, we're going to avoid, we must avoid foolish arguments. They are harmful and useless. They are the opposite of good works. Unprofitable. But instead, what are we to do? We're to reject divisive, a divisive man after the first and second admonition. Knowing that such a person is warped and sinning. You must reject a divisive man. Now, there's a number of questions in order to understand this text, right? Um, begin to write these down if you're taking notes, because I'm going to use these to go for the next um, half an hour, maybe. We want to know, one, is this a heretic, or is this a guy who just has, starts trouble in the church? Is it one of these, or is it both? Okay, two, how do you know a divisive man? Divisiveness can be hard to measure. How do you know it, and what is it, and what is it not? Three, what does the reject mean? What does that mean? What do I do with him? Four, how does this affect the doctrine of church discipline as a whole? And then finally, five, um, are we the only one who believes this way? Okay, so first, the, is this talking about a heretic or a divisive man in the church? The answer is yes. Yes, it's talking about both. It is not only talking about the Benny Hins of the world or the T.D. Jakes of the world or somebody who's denying the Trinity. It is not only referring to that, but it refers most clearly to someone who causes division in the church, whether they use a big doctrine or a little one. They can use a good doctrine and cause it to be division in the church. Or they can use a evil doctrine. Jesus said, wisdom is known by our children. Wisdom is known by our children, beloved. Think about what that means. You can have a heretic who causes a church to blow up, like a Benny Hinn, or you can have somebody who could be a Baptist go into a Presbyterian church and cause that church to blow up over believers' baptism. And that person will be using a good doctrine for an evil purpose. The doctrine, wisdom is known by our children, it produces the same result. Satan doesn't care whether he blows up the church with a heresy or with a, with a, a good doctrine. But with a, when a man is divisive, he must be rejected. Wisdom is known by our children. What else shows that this text is talking about division in the church? That it is the heretic and the man who causes division in the church is shown by the overall context in Titus. Okay? Think about chapter 1, verses 10 to 16. There are idle talkers, deceivers, especially those of the, those of the circumcision. There's doctrine. And verse 16, they're being abominable, disobedient, disqualified for every good work. The combo of life and doctrine. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. 
There's a doctrine of discipleship. There are things that are, speak the things, verse 1, which are proper for sound doctrine. And verse 7, in all, in all things showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. Life and doctrine. Life and doctrine. You cannot separate them. In verses 11 to 15 is the next section. We have the doctrine of the return of the Lord. We have the doctrine of our, our sin and need for repentance. The doctrine of conversion. That the grace of God teaches us that we would deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. And in turn, that turns into practice in verse 14. That we would be his own special people. The doctrine of election, zealous for good works. Life. Life and doctrine. Life and doctrine. In verse, chapter 3, verses 1 to 8, it begins in verses 1 and 2 with good works. And that section ends in verse 8 with maintaining good works. And it's all based in that gospel doctrine. Life and doctrine. Life and doctrine. And so this next section in verses 11 to, um, 9 to 11 is the same idea. In here is life and doctrine. There is doctrines with genealogies, strivings about the law, but then there is also how that works itself out in practical life with division. What else shows us that, that this is a content, generally contentious man, whether by doctrine or by um, his life, is in verse 9, in the context those, in verses 8, we have the good works. Verse 9, we have the bad works connected with this. And in those works, we have contentions, general strivings, general strife. So it shows it's a regular work. It's an evil work that happens in the church. Sometimes people will say, reject a divisive man, and they'll pull out their King James Version, and in, in the King James Version, it has heretic, re reject a heretic. That's an older, that's a, a misunderstanding of the use of this, w the word in Greek here. That's, if you look it up in, in BDAG, one of the re most respected lexicons, they show that that's a, it's a second century idea to, to make the word heretic only for someone who is, has false doctrine. In the New Testament usage, it's either, either or. It's somebody who causes division in the church. That's why it's translated this way in your ESV, in your um, NKJV, or in your NASB. Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition. The word is used that way in the New Testament as well. When you look up all the uses in the New Testament, there is the uses of general strife. Here, it's also used of a, um, an adjective. It's the only time that this word for division is used as an adjective in the Bible. And it's described to the man. And Paul does it in such a way that he uses more words than are necessary. And when you're looking at it in Greek, you can kind of see, he, you know, he was a little he, wordy here. Why was he doing that? To make it very clear that this is the man's character. It's known by his fruit, by what he does. That he's not just a man who has done divisiveness, he's a divisive man. All of us, beloved, can be divisive. All of us have the danger of being divisive with one another. But here we're talking about someone whose character is known by this now. He won't stop doing it. He can't stop doing it. It's in his blood. So we know it by the overall context of Titus, that this is talking about general strife in the church, general division in the church, and not heresy alone. We know that by the general over understanding of Titus and the context of Titus. We know it with a contrast with verse 8. We know it with the description of contentions in verse 9. We know it with the actual description of divisive man. We also know it in the contrast of in verses, chapter 1, verses 10 or 9 to 16. There's the description of the heretic and it's a qualification of a pastor in chapter 1, verse 9, that he may be able to, uh, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and convict those who contradict. 
It, in verse 11, their mouths must be stopped. They are, in verse 13, they must be rebuked sharply. There's a different pattern for how to deal with the heretic here than there is in Titus chapter 3, verse 10, where he says, reject the device of man after the first and second admonition. So because of all these reasons, you can see that this text is talking about general divisiveness, and you can use a big doctrine or a small doctrine. Okay, so now, now that we looked at what this is, what about the practicality of it? How do you know a divisive man? What is one and what is, it, what is not a divisive person? That in Jonathan Lehman's book on church discipline, he gathers some principles um, in pages 112 to 113. And you want to write these down. These, this is one of the more important practical parts of the sermon, okay? So this is the time to wake up. This is the time to wake up and get ready to write these down because this will be important for you to evaluate and help you think through if someone is being divisive later on. You will want to look these up again, okay? So first, um, these are adapted. I adapted these slightly from, you can read his in his own book. I, we may have it on the shelf. From Jonathan Lehman, book on church discipline, pages 112 to 113. First, First principle, they refuse to cease making accusations or spreading their particular doctrinal view when asked to stop. They refuse to cease making accusations or spreading their particular doctrinal view when asked to stop. And when this happens, when they're asked to stop, usually it goes underground. The accu the their particular doctrinal view and their discussions and their trying to um, win arguments, when they're asked to stop, it goes underground. For example, let's look at, let's look at Proverbs 6. Proverbs 6, verses 12 to 15. A worthless person, a wicked man, walks with a perverse mouth, he winks with his eyes, shuffles with his feet, and points with his fingers. Perversity is in his heart. He devises evil continually. He sows discord. Therefore, his calamity shall come suddenly. Suddenly, he will be broken without remedy. There's something deceptive about this guy. He doesn't just come out where everyone can see it and say what he believes. No, he points with his finger. He shuffles his feet as a signal. He's, he's a coward. He's hiding. And his purpose is so that he may sow discord, planting seeds to win people to his view. So one, they refuse to seek make, making accusations or their particular doctrinal view when asked to stop. Two, they are tempting other members to question and suspect and even criticize leadership. They are tempting others to, other members to question, suspect, and even criticize leadership. Look at Genesis 3.1. In Genesis 3.1, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? What is Satan trying to do here? But he's trying to get Eve to suspect God, to question God, to criticize God. And, they, and he does it by a question. So number three, the next principle of a sign of a divisive man. He's actively recruiting fellow dissenters. Actively recruiting fellow dissenters. Proverbs 16, verse 28. Proverbs 16, 28. A perverse man sows strife, and a whisperer separates the best of friends. 
a perverse man who sows strife and, and separating the best of friends is because of pride. It's because of pride that you can't let um, your particular view has got to be made known. You've got to be able to convince people. You've got to be able to have the encouragement of seeing people follow you, the, the affirmation that what I'm doing is true and right. And it ends up separating the best of friends. Point four. From, again, from Jonathan Lehman. I didn't write these. Point four. Their activity has become a clear distraction in the church's life. It frequently has arisen in conversations between members. It has consumed elder time, and members admitted that it affected their ability to listen to sermons. This has happened, these four points have happened to us in the past few weeks. He adds another point that has to do with um, accusations. He says, another mark of a divisive person is they make, five, they make claims that they couldn't, they can't corroborate with other evidence or witness. In other words, they make an accusation and they don't have any evidence or any witnesses. And they stick to it, regardless of being called out on that. These are practical, helpful points for you to know when divisiveness is around. What is divisive? What is it not? Okay? Think about what it's not. And this, I hope to make this clear to you. Divisiveness is not having a different doctrinal view in the church. Divisiveness is not having a different ministry of philosophy or how we should run the church. Divisiveness is not holding these things. I, beloved, I know that I have room to grow. And I'm part of the leadership team. I know that in, I hope in the years to come, 10 years from now, I'm stronger doctrinally than what I am now. And some of you can help me for that. It's not divisiveness to hold a different position in the church. It is not divisive to question or confront leadership. We need that. We need that badly. We need your accountability. I need your accountability with this sermon. You've got to listen and evaluate, and if I say something wrong, you have to confront me. I need it. We all need it as a body. It's not divisiveness to question or confront leadership. It is divisiveness to question and confront leadership to somebody else and convince them of your opinion and not having talked with the leadership. It is wrong to suspect someone of divisiveness without evidence. It is wrong to think, well, I know this person's having trouble. Maybe they're going to leave the church. And so then you begin to think, oh, I saw them talking in the parking lot. It must have been a divisive conversation. <laughs> it happens, right? You're not to have that. Then you will be the divisive person. Do you see that? <laughs> you see how this can happen to every one of us? It's not something that's, oh, it's just for so-and-so. It will happen to you. Understand what it is and what it's not. Okay, now that you, you understand the doctrine of it, it's not just somebody who's an heretic, all-out heretic. It is somebody who causes division in the church with a big doctrine or a little one. And it works out in evil works. It is, understand what it is and what it's not by these principles. Now, understand, what does it mean to reject a divisive person? That's what the text says for us to do. That's what we're commanded to do from this text. And particularly Titus is commanded to do it. He has a responsibility in the leaders. He, he, here we're, we're told, reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition. So this rejection, let's look at Romans 16, verses 17 to 18 helps us understand what this rejection is. Now I urge you, brethren, Romans 16, 17, now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, 
but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. So here you're told to avoid them. Don't hang out with them. In the commentary on Titus, Knight says that they must be removed from the fellowship of the Christian community. Though ESV says, have nothing more to do with them. Have nothing more to do with them. In the same way this word is used, paraitetamai, it's used for rejecting false doctrine. I looked up in 13 different dictionaries, and every one, when they refer to Titus 3, you know what they say? Reject them. <laughs> Have nothing more to do with them. You don't hang out with the person. That's what it means. In the New Testament, I'm looking up all the uses of this um, verb in the New Testament, and it, none of them are dealing with a person. So I'm like, how do I understand? Okay, what do I do with a person? They're... they're I, with ideas about people who rejected God or ideas about rejecting doctrine. But what do I do with a person? Well, Josephus helps us with that because he's using the same type of um, Koine Greek, right? And he describes, when he tells about the story of Amnon and Tamar, he uses this word. Amnon and, and Tamar, Amnon wanting to sexually abuse his half-sister. So he devises a plot. Okay, I'm going to pretend like I'm sick, and she's going to make me some pancakes and, because she makes them just right, and then he's going to kick everybody else out of the house so that he can attack her. And the word that he uses to say to get everybody out of the house and not be there is this rejection. Have nothing more to do. Get, they are out, 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 out of the presence so that he can attack her. What we are to do with a divisive person what you are to do is to reject them when it gets to this point. Have nothing more to do with them. Okay, so now how does this affect the doctrine of church discipline as a whole? Some will say, well, this can't be a text on church discipline because it's different than Matthew 18. Where are the steps? Listen, church discipline doesn't come in a box that you just hand out to the same dose to everybody in the same measure. If somebody comes, we used this example before, somebody comes, you know, I'm planning to kill so-and-so, I'm, you know, I'm planning to kill this guy over here, that you don't bring him back. You don't allow him back for the next service, right? <laughs> you don't handle him the same as somebody who's having trouble with their marriage or something, right? You don't handle church discipline all cases the same. And the Bible expresses that and gives different prescription for different types of people. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul from a letter, from a letter, he's not there. He says, get the church discipline on the move. He's already out. I'm, I'm telling you in the letter, he's already out, this guy in Corinth. And why? Because of the circumstance, because of the public nature of his sin. Everybody knew it. There's a different circumstance, so he has a different set of steps. Matthew 18 is the norm. Here in Titus, there's a particular danger of divisiveness, and speed is of the essence. Speed is of the essence, beloved. Because divisiveness is a church destroyer. And it can happen just like that. So now, are, are we the only ones who believe this? Well, listen to Jay Adams. People like to quote Jay Adams. Jay Adams says, if he isn't dealt with quickly, speaking about this text, if he isn't dealt with quickly, he will split your church before you know it. Many churches have been destroyed by failure to observe this command to the letter, thinking they knew better than God. They spent long time periods of time working with people whose purpose in prolonged counseling was to give them more opportunity to influence others in the congregation. Actually, in order to save the one, they hurt many. And they lose many. Because you think you know better than this text, you think you will be more merciful than God. Don't think that in your arrogance. We cannot be more merciful than God. He is the most merciful one. Believe this text. Believe it. Some more quotes. Brian Chappell says, 
There's a difference between needing to divide and loving to divide. A divisive person loves to fight. The differences are usually observable. A person who loves the peace and purity of the church may be forced into a division, but it's not his character. He enters arguments regrettably and infrequently. When forced to argue, he remains fair, truthful, and loving his responses. He grieves to have, other, to, have to disagree with a brother. Those who are divisive, divisive by nature lust for the fray, incite its onset, and delight in being able to conquer another person. In other words, they love to debate. He goes on, for them, victory means everything. So in an argument, they twist words, call names, threaten, manipulate procedures, and attempt to extend the debate as long as possible. And along as many fronts as possible, divisive persons frequent the debates of the church. As a result, the same voices and personalities tend to appear over and over again, even though the issues change. Paul's words caution us about the seriousness of being divisive. Though ego and entertainment may be served by argument, such engagement damages the church and should be avoided unless absolutely necessary. Here, John Calvin. Calvin says, we must see that what he means here in this text by the word heretic there is a common and well-known distinction between heretic and schismatic. That's what he's saying. He's saying the same thing. There's a difference between the guy who just has false doctrine and the guy who causes division in the church. Calvin says, here, in my opinion, Paul disregards that distinction. For by the term heretic, he describes not only those who cherish and defend the erroneous and perverse doctrine, but in general, all those who do not yield assent to the sound doctrine, which is laid down a little before. In other words, those strivings, it was in verse 9, those contentions. He goes on, this under, under, under this name, he includes all ambitious, unruly, contentious persons who, let, led away by sinful passions, disturb the peace of the church and raise disputings. In short, every person who, by his overweening pride, breaks up the unity of the church is pronounced by Paul to be a heretic. Stephen Cole is a pastor in our Conservative Baptist Association out in Arizona. He says regarding this text, Some people say that it means something less than excommunication. But surely Paul wouldn't allow such divisive, sinning men to remain in the fellowship of the church, trying to recruit more people to their cause, since divisiveness and trying to recruit people to join a faction are sins. Those who persist, persist in such sins must be put out of the church after the first and second warning by church leaders. He goes on, he says, It's far easier to debate theology and obtruse points of doctrine than it is to love your wife as Christ loved the church, to love your children and bring them up in instruction of the Lord, to be a good worker at your job and to practice the fruit of the Spirit on a daily basis. That is not to say that theology is unimportant or irrelevant. Quite the contrary, he says. Rather, it's, it's, it is to say that it's easy to use theological debates as a convenient cover for sins such as anger, pride, selfishness, impatience, and laziness. Johnny Mack says, about this text. So he stands against the truth, speaking of the advice of man, against the leadership of the church, against the will of the Spirit. He may be holding some novel interpretation, some novel myth, some genealogical extrapolation, some mystical interpretation. He may be holding some ignorant interpretation of Scripture. He may also be holding some course of action, some personal whim, some personal preference about behavior or conduct or whatever. The issue is he is divisive. What do we do? The verb says reject. Reject, that's the last word. Have nothing more to do with them. Reject. It's very much like Matthew 18, 17. Let him to be to you as a pagan and an outcast. Cut him off from the fellowship. In 2 Corinthians 3, verse 14, if anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that man. Do not associate with him so that he may be put to shame. Do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Do you see, the, again, the twofold purpose is to Win him by shaming him. It's concern for his soul, the device of man. It's also concern for the church. We're not the only ones who believe this in history or presently. But I, I, I tell you, church discipline, many people grow tired of it because it's hard work. Don't grow tired of it, beloved. Remember the first church discipline in the church. Acts 5, God kills Ananias and Sapphira. He's the one who takes the first act 
in it. And people were afraid to come because of it. People who didn't come to church because of the church discipline that happened there. You know, I'm using that lightly. You know, I'm, to say what God did was very serious. Okay? And I plead with you. If you disobey this text, it will have great effects on your life. Think about the, the blessings of unity. Don't you remember Psalms 133? How good and blessed is it for when brethren dwell together in unity. Amen. It's like the, the, the oil that comes down Aaron's beard or the, the dew on Mount Hermon. Remember that text? How good is it when we dwell together in unity? Not uniformity, but unity in the doctrines that we hold. But oh, what a destructive force it will bring in your life if you say, you know, I know better than, than God. I'll be on Facebook with my, my friend who may be divisive. I will, and I, I warn you, that you can't underestimate what it means to disobey God's word. You can't underestimate the foolishness of rejecting this command. It's a church destroyer. It's a poison when you say, well, I can see these points of wisdom. I see that um, the points of divisiveness and how it's in somebody, and I'm going to hang out with them anyway. That's a bold face, defiance to God. Be warned. Be warned. If you don't reject a divisive man, that poison will come in your life. So I, I warn you and I plead with you, please, please don't fall prey to this in your pride and your arrogance. But because of the gospel... Remember that this command is to be obeyed. In verse 11, he says, Know this, know this. Knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self condemned. Know, first, he gives three things to know. Know first that he's warped. This is referring that he's corrupt. It's like Calvin uses a description of a condemned building in this term. They say that just like when you look on a building, and it may look all right on the outside, but inside it's a crumbling edifice. It's ready to fall down upon you. So it is with a divisive man. He may look all right on the outside, but he's already corrupt and perverted, warped. And the, the verb usage here is very interesting. There's a difference between warped and sinning. In this one sentence, warped is in the perfect passive. Sinning is in the present active indicative. So the, what that means is he's warped. It happened in the past with ongoing results. It's a past completed event. His warping already happened. And now you're just seeing the results of it. You see? And in many cases, it's because he's lost. He's already warped. And know now what he's doing now in the present active indicative, what, he is sinning. Don't make any doubt about it. He is sinning with divisiveness. Know that the a divisive man is warped. Know that he's currently sinning. And know that the condemnation doesn't come from the church, doesn't come from you, doesn't come from, it comes from him. He's, he's self-condemned. He's the one who did it to himself. To close, there's, um, in the year 2000, January 31st, um, there was a flight 261 in Alaska Airlines. And it was a McDonnell Douglas and MD-83 flying, and 88 people on board. And as they're flying over the Pacific Ocean, what happens is they begin to lose pitch control. That's where the airplane goes nose up or nose down, right? 
and they lost control, went into a nosedive, and then went tumbling. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Everyone died. The NTSB um, looks into the, the accident, and they begin to, to see from the wreckage that there is a jack screw in the back of the airplane that allows that, con that control of the airplane, and it, it was a maintenance error. Uh, I work in aircraft maintenance, so this story is particularly um, impactful to me. And what happened is there's a schedule of lubrication for this jack screw, and one after another, mechanic decided, you know, it's too hard to get to that. It's going to take me four hours to do that job. It just take me an hour if I avoid it. And they neglected it. And one after another, neglected it, neglected it. And why? Because of complacency. Because of think thinking, you know, I've looked at it a million times. I've been doing this for 10 years. Never seen one break. It'll be all right. And it goes on and goes on. And 88 people are dead. The same thing is true in the church, with church discipline. People say, you know, I, I know he's saying things that he shouldn't, but I can, I'll just look, overlook it. It'll be all right. We'll get by. I know he's doing things he shouldn't. I know that sin is happening. I'm just going to look it over. It'll be okay. And you don't believe the Word of God. No, I believe this text. I believe it so much that I will live it with the people I love. I believe what God says here. And I believe that even those who are genuine believers who have left, and I see them disobeying this command, I know the effect it will have on them. I believe it, so I'm going to live it. By God's grace, do you believe it? Do you believe this? Will you apply this with wisdom and grace? Will you apply this, believing the Word of God, that this is a command that you need to obey? Beloved, apply it with all wisdom, grace, and fervency. God knows better than us. Let's pray. Dear God, please help us to be balanced. Help us not to suspect our brothers and sisters in an unrighteous way. Lord, help us um, with those who are, without a doubt, been divisive. Help us to, to faithfully obey your word in, in great faith because of what you've done in the gospel. Lord, we don't deserve to be in the church. We don't deserve to go to heaven Help us, Lord, to conduct ourselves with good works in, while we're here in the church. We need you, Lord, desperately with this. Amen.